Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 24th of April. I'm Yael Shear, and this is IBA News, broadcasting live from Jerusalem. Israel Today commemorated Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day. At 10 a.m., sirens blared for two minutes as the nation came to a standstill and people bowed their heads in memory of the six million Jews who perished at the hands of the Nazis. Shortly after, a wreath-length ceremony took place at the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Memorial at the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Among those attending the ceremony were President Reuven Rivlin, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern, and other government officials and delegations from across the country. At the Knesset, lawmakers participated in a name-reading ceremony of Holocaust victims. Earlier this afternoon, thousands of Israelis and Jewish youth from around the world participated in the 29th annual March of the Living, walking from Auschwitz to Birkenau. The closing ceremonies marking the end of this year's memorial will take place in Kibbutz Yad Mordechai and Kibbutz Lochame Hagitaot. The vast hatred of Jews, global apathy to the horrors that occurred, and the Allies' blatant unwillingness to come to the aid of the Jewish people enabled the Holocaust to occur, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said at the annual ceremony which marked the start of Holocaust Memorial Day at Yad Vashem last night. Quoting recently released UN documents that prove the Allies were aware of the annihilation and massive destruction in 1942, which is two years earlier than previously thought, Netanyahu said the new research was of terrible significance. The Prime Minister took fault with the Allied forces during World War II, saying the failure of the world powers to bomb concentration camps took the lives of four million Jews and others. He continued with a message of strength, saying that those who plan to annihilate us are placing themselves in danger of annihilation, adding, the generations who built and continue to build Israel have turned to the Jewish state, have turned the Jewish state into one of the strongest defense forces in the world. President Reuven Rivlin said the gas chambers were not built as a crime against humanity, but for the purpose of annihilating the Jewish people, continuing that while the Holocaust is, quote, permanently branded in our flesh, it is not the lens through which we should examine our past and future. Every year, six Holocaust survivors light beacons, serving as a dual purpose in memory of those who perished, as well as lights of hope for the future. A 28-year-old female security guard deployed at the Kalandia Crossing north of Jerusalem was lightly wounded after being stabbed in the shoulder by a female Palestinian terrorist this morning. According to initial reports, 41-year-old Asiya Ka'abne from Nablus was waiting in a queue to pass through the checkpoint when she approached the security guard, withdrew a knife from her bag, and stabbed her. The security guard was transferred to Adassa Hospital in Ain Karim, where doctors described her condition as light. Security forces at the crossing overpowered the female terrorist and handed her over for questioning. The Shin Bet security agency said she told investigators she had quarreled with her husband and decided to wage the attack hoping that she herself would be shot by security forces. An Israeli couple has developed a mobile app that allows Jews across the globe and supporters of Israel to commemorate Holocaust Remembrance Day and the annual memorial service for Israel's fallen soldiers by listening to the siren as it sounds out in Israel. Called Standstill, the app was developed by Amir Zwickel and his wife Rotem in collaboration with the Foundation for the Benefit of Holocaust Victims in Israel and the Lone Soldiers Center in memory of fallen Israeli soldier Michael Levin. The couple said the app aims to share the most Israeli days with the world, inviting people across the globe to be part of Israel's community, even if it is just for two minutes when the siren sounds. Once a year, some Israeli couples open their homes to the public, inviting Holocaust survivors to share their life stories and memories with Israel's future generations. The survivors relay their stories in order to make their messages heard, to never allow the murder of Jews to happen again. The project, which began several years ago, has proven popular among Israelis, and for many it provides their first meeting with Holocaust survivors. We decided, both my husband and I decided to open our home because um, we read about this project a few years ago and I feel that it's like the, just the end of 
all the generations chance to meet in person with people who have been there and uh, who have experienced personally the Holocaust. I thought it was a fascinating story and moreover I think it's very important to hear these stories and it's, it connects you in a much more emotional level to, to the whole story of the Holocaust and World, and World War II. So as long as we still have this rare opportunity of, of having this uh, indirect contact with people who actually experience this, I think it's, it's very important and it also allows us to in a way, let the next generation sort of pass on the story. The annual anti-Semitism report released for Holocaust Memorial Day found that violent incidents have dropped by 12 percent worldwide, but U.S. campuses have become hotbeds of Jewish hatred, and there's been a surge of 45 percent of anti-Semitic incidents there. IBA's Ari O'Sullivan has more. Surprising or not, anti-Semitism grew in the country the most not identified with hate, the United States. According to the Cantor Center for the Study of Contemporary European Jewry's annual report, this past year saw a dramatic spike of 45 percent of incidents in the American campuses and universities. The university's campuses, uh, both on, uh, across the United States and in Canada, the cases in them rose in 2016, and we mentioned it, by 45 percent. This is related in a large part to the anti-Israeli activity on the campuses led by pro-Palestinian bodies, NGOs, BDS movements. A lot of cases that are as if anti-Zionist, but they are spoken and expressed and done with anti-Semitic motives. Anti-Semitism grew with the election of Donald Trump as the president, mainly seen by vandalism of graves and graffiti. It was not just in the U.S., but also in Britain, which saw an 11 percent rise in incidents, even in Australia, a 10 percent rise. While the Anglo-Saxon world saw a rise, the rest of the world saw a drop by about 12 percent. There were 361 incidents last year, compared to 410 in 2015. France once topped the list, but now saw a 61 percent drop, as well as in Belgium, possibly due to increased security measures. Internet is a strong presence of anti-Semitism, particularly on Twitter and Facebook. Officials say that in Europe, moves by far-right groups to appear as allies of the Jews shouldn't be trusted. The common understanding between the Jewish communities is that these parties, even if for the short term, could, could look as if they are an allies for the long term. They're definitely a threat. On the bright side, the report found that the wave of Islamic migrants to Europe were too busy to be involved in anti-Semitism of the fear that was prevalent that the newcomers would come and anti-Semitism would rise all over because they come from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. This is like blaming the whole public before they even set foot uh, somewhere. And the answer is that they are busy being absorbed and surviving. And those who are perpetrating are, as before, radical right, Islamists and hooligans. The ironic evidence shows that the one spot where the extreme right meets the extreme left is their common hatred of the Jew. Ari O'Sullivan for IBA News. Joining us now in the studio is Ephraim Zoroff, the director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Israel, as well as IBA's Ari O'Sullivan. Thanks for joining us. So we just heard Dr. Dina Parad of the Cantor Center saying that Islamic migrants to Europe were too busy to be involved in anti-Semitism. What do you have to say about that? Well, that might be true in the short run. The question is, of course, is what will happen once they get absorbed and once they feel more comfortable where they are. And the danger is uh, they come from countries with deep anti-Semitic traditions and their minds have been poisoned against Israel. And uh, I... It's hard to see, really. It's hard to predict how their uh, lives in Germany will change that, if at all. Ephraim, tonight uh, President Ruben Rivlin will be hosting the German former president uh, Jochiam Gauck at the closing ceremonies of the Holocaust Memorial Day. Why is he the wrong person to have invited to this ceremony? He's the wrong person because he signed something called the Prague Declaration, which was signed in the Czech capital on June 3rd, 2008, and basically equates communism with Nazism. 
And this Prague Declaration also has a series of demands which undermine the uniqueness of the Holocaust. For example, one of those demands is a, uh, a uh, Memorial Day to be set aside for all the victims of totalitarian regimes. In other words, those are the Nazis and those are the communists. And if such a step were to be adopted, and there are already countries marking that day, and there have already been at least four decisions, luckily non-binding by European forums, to recognize that day, what do you need International Holocaust Day for? In other words, uh, this day will be more inclusive, more universal, and relate to far more victims. Why, why, add another, why have an International Holocaust Day? Not to mention the fact that they're calling for the rewriting of all the European textbooks in the spirit of equality or equivalency between communism and Nazism. And they want to set up a European Institute of Memory and, and Conscience, which will help the local museums, almost all of which focus almost exclusively on communist crimes. Mm -hmm. And I can just tell you about the one in Vilnius, for example, where until two years ago there wasn't a word about the real, the real genocide, which was the, uh, the Shoah. And most of the material, a lot of the material about communist crimes emphasized Jews who were communist criminals. Ephraim, you know, in the big picture, it seems like the Holocaust denial in the West has been pretty much defeated. But what, what are some of the new lies that are being told about the Holocaust we have to look at? Okay, first of all, we're seeing attempts to rewrite the narrative and, in a sense, free certain groups of, of, of people in different countries from their responsibility. Now, most of this is taking place in Eastern Europe, but for example, not that long ago, Marine Le Pen all of a sudden absolved France of responsibility for the roundup by Vichy police of 12,000 Jews in Paris in 1942. Now, in the East, they would not, they didn't, first of all, we have to understand that the nature of collaboration with the Nazis in Eastern Europe was different than the rest of the continent. Only in Eastern Europe, did collaboration involve active participation in systematic mass murder. Now, these countries were not liberated, in quotation marks, after the war. They became either part of the Soviet Union under communist domination. The communists and the Soviet Union did their own manipulation of the history of the Holocaust. Uh, so, for example, in, in the Soviet Union or under communism, you never heard any acknowledgment that Jews had been singled out for murder. Mm -hmm. And if you, go, if you went to the monuments that were made in some of the biggest places of, of murder of Jews during the Holocaust, you saw captions about peaceful Soviet citizens being murdered by Hitlerite bourgeois fascists. So instead of adopting the Western narrative, the accepted narrative, which is also the Jewish narrative about what happened during the Shoah, these countries in Eastern Europe are writing their own narrative, which denies or attempts to hide or minimize their own role in the crimes, and to try and claim that communist crimes were genocide, they too were victims, and they deserve sympathy rather than approbation. So, uh, uh, there were... Just briefly, uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Simon Hyer, the founder of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, has been chosen as the first non-Israeli to light a torch on Israel's Independence Day. What does this say about the Simon Wiesenthal Center? Well, listen, I have to say this is a great honor for Rabbi Hyer. Rabbi Hai has devoted his life to causes uh, to help the Jewish people fight against the anti-Semitism, increase tolerance, increase Holocaust education, and uh, has created some really wonderful institutions. So he is one of the people who should certainly be among those candidates who were considered for such an honor, and, and a tremendous supporter of the state of Israel. And I'm sure many people will recall the fact that he quoted the uh, verse that about not forgetting Jerusalem, if I forget Jerusalem, let my right hand lose its cunning at the Trump in, inauguration. So I think he's certainly a very good choice. Ephraim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, REA. And uh, back to our program. Calling the Holocaust the darkest chapter in human history, U.S. President Donald Trump said the mind cannot fathom the pain, horror, and loss of six million Jews that comprise two-thirds of the Jewish community in Europe who were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. Today, only decades removed from the Holocaust, we see a great nation risen from the desert, and we see a proud Star of David waving above the state of Israel. That star is a symbol of Jewish perseverance. It's a monument to unyielding strength. In the memory of those who lost, we renew our commitment and our determination not to disregard the warnings of our own times. 
We must stamp out prejudice and anti-Semitism everywhere it is found. We must defeat terrorism, and we must not ignore the threats of a regime that talks openly of Israel's destruction. We cannot let that ever even be thought of. To all of you tonight who have come from around the world, let it be known, America stands strong with the state of Israel. Centrist Emmanuel Macron will face far-right leader Marine Le Pen in a runoff for the French presidency next month on May 7th. This after 96 percent of the votes counted saw Macron in the lead with 23.9 percent of the votes and Le Pen receiving a close 21.4 percent. Amidst a high security presence with armed forces and police deployed across the country to secure the elections, turnout for the vote was high yesterday, with some 80 percent of France's 47 million people taking to the polling booths. Addressing his cheering supporters, Macron, a former banker and minister of economy under the current government and also the youngest presidential candidate, called on the public to rally against nationalists, saying he has changed the life of French politics. On her part, Le Pen, who views herself as the people's candidate, lauded the results and declared the survival of France was at stake. Israel is resisting a U.S. bid to extradite the Israeli-American teenager who made a series of bomb threats to Jewish community centers and Jewish institutions around the world, including the United States, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. The suspect was arrested last month at his home in Ashkelon and indicted today in court. According to authorities, the teenager made thousands of threatening phone calls to U.S. institutions and schools using a software disguised voice. He's charged with numerous crimes, including extortion, money laundering, conveying false information, and cyberstalking. The suspect allegedly tried to extort a U.S. Republican senator, delivering drugs to his home in an effort to incriminate him. In addition, he also allegedly set up a phone threat service, accepting payment to make threats. Nearly two million shekels in bitcoins were discovered in the suspect's internet account. His parents now claim that he's battling a brain tumor and have appealed to the court on his behalf, asking to forgive his actions and be sympathetic to his condition. His defense lawyer revealed to reporters that although the teenager has a high IQ, he has the emotional intelligence of a five-year-old. The bomb threats led to massive evacuations and heightened security in Jewish communities throughout the U.S., leading to concerns of a possible resurgence in anti-Semitism. FBI Director James Comey called the suspect's behavior a federal crime aimed at frightening innocent people and disrupting entire communities. The teenager has so far expressed zero remorse for his actions. Six Israelis from Beersheba were arrested by police and the Shin Bet Security Service on suspicion of violently attacking Arabs in the southern Israeli city. Two soldiers and a minor were among those detained for questioning. A statement released by the Shin Bet yesterday said the attacks began in December last year, with the suspects using knives, crowbars and batons. According to the agency, one of the most violent attacks occurred in February of this year, when suspects stabbed one of the victims. After undergoing questioning, the suspects tied themselves to at least five attacks against Arabs and admitted to vandalizing an Arab's car. Lawyers for some of the suspects claimed their clients were tortured and prevented from meeting with them. The suspects appeared in court on, in Beersheba yesterday and are facing charges of acts of terror. Efforts are underway to prevent the Histadrut from declaring an open-ended strike tomorrow that will encompass government offices, public transport, hospitals, universities and other institutions. The Federation of the Chambers of Commerce submitted an appeal to the Labor Court yesterday asking to issue an injunction and prevent the strike. They estimate the first day of the strike will cause 100 million shekels in damages. A statement issued by the Histadrut said the strike was called to fight the abuse of IBA and the new broadcasting corporation employees that has incited one group of workers against the other, violating the norms required in labor relations. Until this broadcast, it is still unclear whether the strike will take place, with reports saying Nisenkorn and Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon have reached a compromise that may avert it. Meanwhile, the fate of IBA English News still remains uncertain. The cabinet yesterday approved the delay in the launching of the new broadcasting corporation, which was slated to replace the existing Israel Broadcasting Authority at the end of the month. 
The revised legislation, which seeks to postpone operations of the new IPBC until the 15th of May, will be brought up for a Knesset vote tomorrow and the second and third readings on Wednesday. At this point, there are no plans to incorporate English news into the future programming. We're trying to do everything we can to influence decision makers and stress the significance of continuing English television broadcasts. If you wish to help us in this campaign, please write to the Minister of Communications, Sahi Hanegbi, asking to keep English TV news alive. His email address and fax is on the screen below. That email is sar at moc dot gov dot il. Together, maybe we can all make a difference. In finance, the stocks were up on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and the shekel was mixed in foreign exchange trading. Here are the late afternoon numbers. Turning to the forecast, the IBA weather team says tonight will be partly cloudy and tomorrow will be fair with a significant rise in temperatures and strong northerly winds prevailing along the coast. Here's a look at the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. That's all for this newscast. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same channel, when Laura Cornfield will be at this desk. Until then, I'm Yael Shear, wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem. <laughs>